Okay. Um, so, um, as we mentioned on Monday, we have a guest speaker here um, who is showing up as David B on your uh, screen. And I will, without further ado, let Rishi um, introduce him, since you've all met Rishi before. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, so uh, David uh, is um, someone that uh, I met through, uh, through my mom, actually. Um, he has been uh, meditating for over 45 years. Um, so I think there was... Uh, kind of a, a like some sense of a camaraderie there um having come from you know uh the the practical tradition that i grew up with i guess um and david is somebody that has uh i guess wh who we would consider as uh enlightened or awakened in i guess most conventional terminologies um the way david usually talks about it is is that consciousness woke up to itself or became aware of itself through the body um, and he can probably clarify that a lot better than I can um, but uh, he's not somebody that um, is usually considered as like a teacher or a guru um, and uh, he has in in like the activity and, and work of his daily life has gone kind of the academic route uh, with a seminary PhD in the Vedic sciences um, and has uh, written a dissertation and, and written pretty extensively about uh, kind of, I would say, de further developing and integrating the, the Western understanding with, uh, uh, with these kind of um, descriptions of the, the inner workings of consciousness and, and that kind of a thing. Um, uh, well, I mean, I don't know. I'll let you. <laughs> I think I think uh, it'll it'll be a, a, an interesting. Um, it, it was definitely a very interesting thing for me to to first uh, talk with him, uh, both with the similarities and the and the differences from I guess what you'd expect. Uh, for someone experiencing that, but I think the that the 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 real um, I don't know the the real rarity and the value is that this is somebody with uh, an academic background uh, that can express uh, through that way, but also has the the grounding in the in the experiential kind of awareness and consciousness. Um, so it, 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 to me, it, it was a very like uh, helpful and and uh, clarifying. Uh, thing so <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, enough or uh, good thank you there <laughs> for well, allowing me to do the introduction Dave well thank you Jack and Rishi um, yeah, today I want to talk a little bit about the Vedic perspective that's that's my background uh, as mentioned uh, I've studied uh, Vedic science academically and um, and also uh, experientially um, it's essentially a, a perspective out of ancient India, and uh, Veda means uh, knowledge of the nature of life, and it's among the oldest surviving texts in the world uh, come out of this tradition. It was originally in northwest India. Um, a lot of the stories were considered mythic uh, because the loca you know, for example, it was described as existing along the Saraswati River which didn't exist, but they've discovered more recently with um, satellite imaging that there is a dried up river uh, through that area. And uh, then they discovered large cities uh, in the desert. Uh, there were uh, ancient cities, but the writing they found there has been untranslated. They, they haven't uh, figured out how, how to translate it yet. Um, the Vedic culture has had a profound impact on um, the world, even today. Uh, the way we measure space and time uh, go back to this culture. The days of the week, months of the year, hours in a day, <clears throat> degrees in a circle, and so forth. They developed quite a sophisticated uh, set of sciences, medicine, astronomy, mathematics, um, 
and quite sophisticated and uh, we continue to get to be surprised by how sophisticated as, as, uh, as it's discovered. Um, but the understanding of a lot of that material is, has been lost. Uh, for example, the, the core Rig Veda, the foundation of the, the Vedic thought, doesn't make a lot of sense <laughs> when you read it, really. It just sounds like a, you know, a bunch of mythological stories and things. But actually, it's an encoded, it's encoded experiences. You see, it's written in Sanskrit, and Sanskrit is this ancient language where the, the sound of the words and the meaning uh, are aligned. The, the sound that creates the form and the meaning, it's all tied together. And so essentially someone who's uh, clearly awake on refined level where uh, the world is uh, a field of vibration just becoming, if you listen to these stories on that level, you can actually have the experience of the original uh, seer uh, that uh, wrote, the, wrote the text. So like I say, it's, it's their encoded experiences, um, which make a lot more sense when they can be experienced directly. Um, the Vedic tradition was oral for thousands of years, um, but as they describe in the, in the Vedic tradition, the uh, texts are, uh, or the, the uh, time moves in, in vast cycles, like seasons. So we have uh, age, golden ages, and silver and bronze and and uh, iron ages essentially what as the greek described the greek uh, greeks uh, described it these vast cycles of time where consciousness rises and falls and we went through a a, a long period of a descent um uh and uh the sage uh, rather vyasa uh, could see the, the coming uh, dark age and so he wrote down the text to preserve them and some of them were still lost, but uh, the core texts and, and uh, many others uh, have been preserved. He organized the, the Rig Veda into the form it is in today. And we know it today. Um, gathering together the, the experiences or the, the, the cognitions of these various sages into a, an organized format. Uh, later in the tradition, uh, we, we have Vasishta, who was the, uh, the teacher of Prince Rama. Uh, in the epic story of the Ramayana. Uh, but probably the biggest influence on modern Indian thought is Adi Shankara. Uh, he brought out the Sanata Dharma. Um, he had his disciples, his key disciples, uh, found four seats of learning in India, in the north, south, east, and west. He revived the monastic tradition that had, um, had uh, faded and uh, brought out Vedanta as uh, Advaita or non-duality, which you may have heard of today. Today's uh, modern Neo-Advaita is not really what Shankara was pointing to though, um, and it kind of ignores his later teaching, um, uh, where he got into more of the uh, refinement and uh, of the process of the unfolding uh, enlightenment. But the key with all of this stuff is application. Philosophy has little value unless we can live it. You know, you can certainly develop really interesting concepts and, and beliefs, but by itself, that's just mind. It's just like a dream, you know, value. It's, it's kind of an idea and, and it can certainly be a strong filter through which we experience the world, but it's, it's still, not grounded in reality, basically. And uh, faith, on the other hand, uh, can culture the heart. But both need to be grounded in our higher nature, or we, we get tossed around by the events of life. And it's very hard to sustain uh, our faith, our uh, sense of reality, when life changes, as it always does. So this is where, where the key, one of the key aspects of uh, the Vedas come in, and that is application. What is the means of developing uh, this unfolding so that uh, you can come to a place of, of um, living uh, uh, these ideas? Now, when I use the term yoga, this, this is the means in, in Vedas, you probably 
think of some somebody doing stretching exercises or a yoga studio somewhere. Um, and they often talk in terms of control and uh, values of force and concentration uh, in modern interpretations of yoga. However, it's the actuality is kind of the opposite. It's about letting go of control and uh, allowing um, and uh, letting life itself move through you as opposed to trying to control. Um, it's the ego, the identified ego that thinks that I am this individual person and I'm separate from other people um, that creates uh, issues with, with uh, our experience of life and, and tends to cause us to have uh, difficulties and, and challenges. Uh, whereas if we can experience our deeper nature, our universal nature, then uh, our experiences are put in a much larger context and we can unfold we can uh, soften the, the attachment to the, the ego and um, uh, open up to our uh, to a fuller value of this. And then with direct experience, uh, philosophy becomes lived rather than theoretical. They have a, a term in the Vedic tradition, uh, Atman, which means the self with a capital S. It's essentially our cosmic nature or universal nature. Um, I have a quote here from the Katha Upanishad. The Upanishads are kind of excerpts from the larger texts, uh, the Reader's Digest version, so to speak. Taught by an inferior man, the self cannot easily be known, even though often reflected upon. Unless taught by one who knows him as none other than his own self, there is no way for him, for he is subtler than the subtlest, beyond the range of reasoning. So beyond the mind, uh, beyond the, the content of experience, the, the self is that which is doing the experiences and is also the essentially the screen on which experiences are unfolding. Of course, this is taking a perspective that consciousness itself is fundamental, that the world we experience around us arises in consciousness as do we ourselves. And uh, just as Christianity has developed branches over time, so too, this has happened in India, but even for a longer period of time. So there's this vast array of philosophical approaches. The core uh, Vedic approach, uh, that there's a set of six philosophies, um, the darshanas, uh, of which yoga is one, Vedanta, Vedanta is another. Um, these are sometimes thought to be competing philosophies, but in actuality, they're uh, perspectives of the different stages of development. And so each of them has validity in its own time. Now today, uh, as the philosophies and, and religions of India are kind of lumped under, excuse me, Hindu, um, which is essentially a name given by the English to group it all together, uh, including things that are not necessarily related um, now, it may seem otherwise, but it is essentially a monotheistic perspective. There is some variation on that, but broadly, um, there is considered to be one God or one reality with many expressions. And so you can follow the expression uh, or the embodiment that you favor. But again, uh, modern India's expression is kind of superficial. Um, Buddha uh, came along and, and uh, you'll be hearing about that, I understand. Um, and he basically got rid of all the, all the ritual and the, and the uh, belief structures and stuff and came back to the, the core again. Uh, this is something that's happened uh, around the world over the centuries, uh, over the ages, where someone is not just enlightened, but they have an understanding of the means of uh, bringing it to other people as well. Uh, this is this is quite rare. And so this person comes forward and helps enlighten other people. And a, uh, a group develops. But what tends to happen after about three or 400 years is that the core understanding that means is lost. And so the 
it just becomes um, a set of concepts or a philosophy and then degrades further into uh, belief um, without a means. Um, this has happened the world over. It's, it, it happened with the Vedic uh, understanding. It happened with uh, in Buddhism. Uh, and uh, I, I believe it's the same with Christianity as well, where Jesus brought out a means, um, but uh, that means was lost in time. And, uh, it be, you know, degrades into belief and, and dogma. And so periodically someone comes forward again. Uh, but we're now in a time, um, a rising age, where uh, the means is being brought forward. Uh, many more people are waking up. It's nowhere near as rare as it was even a decade ago. And, um, you know, some of those are people who have been meditating for a long time, like myself. And some of those are, are people who have a, a longer term history prior to this life. <laughs> um, that uh, they're bringing that forward and, and uh, apparently waking up without uh, practices and so on. And as, as the collective consciousness rises from more and more people uh, doing appropriate practices and, um, and waking up, it's kind of, we lift all boats, so to speak, the entire collective is, is, um, is raised up and um, we move towards uh, what a predicted golden age. Um, in the West, we tend to think of our current time as the peak of, of evolution and as a technological civilization and that. But uh, from a Vedic perspective, we're actually rising out of a darker age because we lost uh, that sense of our, our uh, universal self and, and our interconnection uh, and our essential nature. Um, and what we're what's happening now is that we're returning to that. And interestingly enough, though, um, technology like we're using today is helping facilitate that. Uh, many spiritual teachers, for example, are, are now doing retreats online in the, using the same kind of technology and uh, allowing uh, people to sit with the spiritual teachers and have what they call darshan, which is essentially exposure. Um, there are occasional people who um, wake up on their own spontaneously, but the vast majority of people wake up through exposure to uh, someone who's awake. Uh, they call this darshan. Um, essentially, uh, the self, it's the self within that universal nature um, that wakes up to itself. And, but this has never happened in our history, history of our soul, you could say. And so we have no, uh, we have no example, no experience to to point to it. So, uh, but when we spend time with, when we culture the ground and prepare, and then spend time with someone who is awake, it's that same self that's waking up, and so the opportunity comes for uh, that self to wake up to itself uh, by recognizing itself through someone who's awake. <laughs> If that makes sense. Would it would it be helpful for uh, questions or or something like that to kind of uh, guide you in your topics or? Yes, that's that's actually what I was about to suggest. Okay, <laughs> um, I was I was going to ask um, since you mentioned um, about uh, both practical application and like background in the in the Vedic um, like study. Uh, would you want to talk about a little bit um, what what kind of spiritual practices uh, you had in this life and what what uh, I don't know the significance of that in in terms of either connection to the enlightenment process or is this something you would want to talk about with that yeah sure okay yeah um, the key from a practical standpoint is um, culture in the ground, essentially, so that we're, we're uh, capable of, of shifting, but also uh, so that when the shift happens, um, that it's a smoother process. Uh, so we're, you know, we don't, we're, we've done the, the sufficient purification and, and preparing the ground. Um, sometimes you see examples of people who shift um, without that preparation, and it tends to be a, a bumpier time. 
Eckhart Tolle famously spent two years sitting on a park bench, you know, trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> uh, uh, for example. So um, here I uh, developed, I developed an interest in, basically I started reading about uh, brain physiology and stuff that at that time they were coming out with, with uh, books on right brain, left brain, you know, uh, how the brain worked and stuff. And that of course leads to uh, consciousness, the topic of consciousness and reading about that. And then that led to the topic of meditation. And I ended up uh, learning TM, Transcendental Meditation. And um, and then in order, you know, I took some classes and stuff that they had available at the time. Uh, but in order to go to go deeper, um, you needed to basically te learn to teach the meditation and go on a course. It was essentially a, a, a six month retreat in, in uh, off season hotels in Europe. And um, so basically I spent a bunch of time doing extra meditation and, and, and doing deep study of, of the, the background and um, it took me much more into the uh, Vedic perspective. Although it's something I've been studying uh, a good part of my life. Um, I did do kind of a Siddhartha thing, though, where, where um, I spent a lot of time in spiritual practice and very focused. And there was a lot of uh, unfolding while I was on that, uh, uh, on the, the, the course. Um, a couple of things happened. One, one is that the, the witness came online. And essentially what that means is the observer value of consciousness woke up. It didn't wake up to itself. So it wasn't a spiritual awakening or self-realization in that kind of sense, but it did become alert. So essentially there's this observer quality um, of consciousness that's awake and witnessing all of experience. Uh, and so what you're experiencing day to day, but it also witnesses dreams and deep sleep. So there's kind of a, a, a value of awakeness, even in uh, deep sleep. And then um, related to that, kind of the lights came on, so to speak, and I began uh, experiencing the um, subtle structures of um, the world around us, um, the nature of the, how the world comes to be and so on like that. Um, there's, there's a lot there though, so it, it takes, <laughs> Uh, quite a bit of time for that to, because there's kind of the, the experience, and then there's the time that mind takes to unpack all that and 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 come to some uh, come to some understanding. Um, and then um, basically, life called me to do some more grounding. Essentially, I didn't didn't see this at the time, but but um, um, I ended up starting a career and a uh, family and and all that stuff and got very involved in the world, still continued to meditate and, and there was still unfolding going on, but it, it became a little bit more in the background and not quite, quite so prominent in my life. And then, um, I guess around 2005, um, I'd been, I was working in IT and, uh, software development, um, managing the development and, and uh, distribution of, of web applications for the construction industry. And um, the life I was living kind of basically fell apart. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, uh, the job, it became clear that, that the company uh, was never going to make any money the way it was, uh, the way it was structured at the time. Um, and um, the, the company, I was the first employee of the company and um, did all the early design work and then hired developers and so on like that. And the company kind of had a number of bad habits uh, that, that revolved around me. And, um, it, and then it, it, because I was working a lot, a lot of hours, it was, uh, that was, having a negative influence on my marriage and, and so forth. So there's just a whole series of, so I made the decision to step back, step out of the company, um, but that actually ended up ending my marriage. And, and so the whole series of things that the life that I had been living uh, fell away. And then the spirituality moved forward again. Just uh, old friends from the, the early days uh, showed up in my life again and, and um, 
Um, and then the opportunity came up. I, I connected with an old friend again, and it turns out he'd woken up and was doing spiritual teaching and, um, and self finally woke up to itself here. And, uh, and I guess because of the long-term uh, preparing the ground that I've been witnessing for 30 years, something like that, um, then the next few stages came fairly quickly. And it's interesting to reflect on now because it's life kind of created these circumstances where not only was there unfolding here, but I was exposed to a lot of other people uh, who were unfolding also. And so I saw a lot of examples of the unfolding and, and the variations and various concepts I had to throw out that turned out to be inaccurate or, or weren't as fixed as I thought, you know, that they were more flexible and variable. Um, and uh, it, it taught me a lot about the process. Um, and through the academic study, I, I found um, some core texts which, which uh, brought out deeper, um, deeper understanding of the process and, and uh, opened up the perspectives a little bit. And so the result was, uh, you know, I, I wrote a book and dissertation and so on stuff on the stages and um, of enlightenment um, based on what I was, you know, the, the core understanding from uh, Basishta I mentioned uh, early on uh, in the Ramayana, uh, but um, but uh, how is it being experienced today? I have a, a question, David. I yes. think uh, kind of on that point, um, do you think it would be helpful? I was wondering maybe if, um, if you would want to give um, maybe some, uh, maybe talk a little bit about on both the kind of quality of experience uh, changes that kind of coincide with uh, consciousness waking up to itself, and like, so what 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 changes in the in the quality of experiencing, and what, and maybe a little bit, just maybe touch on uh, what what is not a quality of experience kind of a change. Does that does that, does that question well, make sense? Yeah, um, okay. it's it's pretty variable. Fundamentally, okay. what what happens is. There's that shift from experiencing yourself as an individual person to experiencing yourself as universal consciousness. So you become unbounded and infinite. And however, it, you know, when people hear about some of this stuff, it sounds kind of flashy and and um, and distinctive. But what most people, uh, one of the first things that happens after the shift is is people will like be really surprised because it's perfectly normal and ordinary. You know, that they it just, it's like nothing changed. It's still the same person, still the same laws of nature that are functioning here. Um, but the perspective changes, essentially. So you're experiencing, instead of you're being, uh, experiencing it as a me who's in the middle of it all, you're kind of, you kind of step back and, and have a more, uh, a bigger perspective, a larger perspective. And so what tends to happen then through experiencing life and going through the usual things we do and going to work and relationships and all that, um, we experience them from the changed perspective. And then there's a kind of a um, unpacking. Um, there's a lot of that can you know happen prior, um, you know, if you have a good spiritual practice, but um, because you're essentially now awake within you're essentially meditating 24 7 because you're always in the in in the in samadhi essentially it's it's uh, it's there all the time and so uh there's a lot lot to the processing it tends to be faster and deeper and, and so on like that so you know you'll basically be going through life and some story comes up in the mind but now because you're in a broader perspective it's like oh that's what i believe well, that's nonsense and and you can throw it out but it was just automatic before and you weren't you know just unconscious and automatic whereas now uh, you're more conscious essentially and so the, the the stuff can come up and leave and and uh when um difficult circumstances come up 
instead of just being purely reactive, we start to learn to uh, more thoroughly to uh, allow and process and complete whatever is coming up so that we're not resisting life and we're not being uh, reactive the same way. So it's kind of like the awakening itself is like that. It's just there's just a recognition. It takes just a fraction of a second. But the unpacking and the integration of that in our daily life, that takes place over time. Um, the old texts talk about in terms of uh, 10 to 12 years to integrate um, fully, uh, just because that's how long it takes to go through the process and live your life in, uh, in a normal kind of way. Um, but the benefits start pretty much right away. And there's a, a kind of a winding down of uh, there's the concept of karma. Karma means uh, action. Um, and essentially when we act in harmony with life, then uh, the, the action completes. But when we uh, act in a way that's a little disharmon uh, disharmonious with, with life, or we're resisting in some way or, or trying to grasp at life in some way, uh, it creates a kind of uh, unresolved uh, some unresolved energy, uh, so to speak, uh, incomplete action. And so it kind of creates a tendency then for that unresolved experience to come up again in our life at some point, uh, sometimes quickly and sometimes uh, over time. So we may notice certain repeating patterns in our life, for example, where we always seem to find the same kind of girlfriend or same kind of boss uh, that we have trouble with. Uh, uh, that's, that's essentially there's a pattern that's that's uh, hasn't resolved itself. So when we <clears throat> uh, step out of being in that, it's much easier to to just allow it to be and, and to let it go. So over time, our life gets simpler and more settled, and uh, the drama kind of settles out uh, and challenges and so on. Um, but we continue being a person and having uh, those experiences of you know the the, the karma we came in with uh, in this life, and that's a whole other kind of topic, but there's kind of like, uh, um, awakening has this, um, we tend to cr produce a lot more unresolved experiences than we resolve in a lifetime. And so over time, uh, those uh, unresolved experiences build up as a kind of backlog. When we uh, clearly awaken uh, that and that ident identification with the me ends, it kind of breaks, it's said to roast the seeds of, of karma, it, it the mountains of karma, um, it uh, breaks that um, connection to it. And, and so they can resolve. However, the sprouted seeds that are unfolding in this life, they continue to, to unfold through the lifetime and uh, on that. So we still, someone who's awake still has challenges, still has uh, ups and downs and so on like that, but they're experiencing it from a different perspective. So it makes life quite a bit smoother and, and, uh, and easier. And, and, that's, and that's where I guess people would talk about uh, like, the, like these flowery language or, or descriptions of, you know, uh, big states of peacefulness and bliss is that is that where you're saying? yeah yeah so such ananda for example is the way they talk about in the vedas um, buddhism uses the word nirvana um but now one of the things that unfolds if there's refined perception is unfolding is uh, a recognition that it's not just the surface experience and consciousness but there's these kind of layers of experience so we have um the physical experience uh, our emotional, our emotions, our, our thoughts, uh, the intellect, intuition level, and then there's what's known as the celestial or the bliss body. Um, and that's the same thing as that fine vibration I was talking about, where if you experience on that level, uh, that's where things were first becoming. And when you experience that subjectively within, that's experienced as bliss. Now, the world around us is being recreated in every moment. And so that fine vibration is going on all the time. And uh, there's a, a whole long list of quali qualities. I've done articles on, on just listing the qualities of that, of that uh, layer. Um, but when, when the, the emotions and the mind are settled enough, 
and uh, there's been enough healing, then that, that quality of inner happiness becomes ongoing. Now, it varies somewhat. Uh, sometimes uh, it can be really uh, uh, almost overwhelming, uh, but just like we're uh, drowning in bliss, so to speak. And sometimes it's just kind of uh, just there in the background and, and uh, as we're busy living our life. Uh, but it's it's essentially uh, you know the the uh, most people are living their life in their thoughts, emotions, and the physical world, the the surface three. Um, but if you look at the the deeper layers, the consciousness, um, the uh, where consciousness first starts structuring, and then that finest uh, celestial level with the bliss body, those three. Uh, are known as Sat, Chit, and Ananda. Uh, those are the qualities of those three subtle levels. So it's kind of like the same functionality is there. It just we shift from being uh, in the body mind to being in uh, consciousness bliss. Um, and the body mind is still there and functioning, but it's not uh, uh, it's not as uh, dominant. So any of you can ask questions, you know. Yes. Is there, is there a way that you've noticed, uh, wait, let me get my question right. Uh, from your, from your experience and your understanding of everything, how do you, how do you recognize someone else that's awakened? Um, well, it depends. There's what I refer to as resonance. Um, and, um, uh, so we individually will tend to resonate with, with some people and not with others, with some teachers and not with others. Um, and there's some superficial things you can say, well, you know, someone might prefer an academically oriented teacher. Someone may prefer uh, a, a more heart-based teacher or, or something like that. But, but there's kind of like a deeper value of, of resonance. And we're going to tend to uh, get the most results with, with, a, with somebody we resonate with. Um, now, fundamentally, when someone wakes up, it's the same self that's woken up. And so when there's some value of resonance, um, then you, it's, you know, you're meeting yourself, so to speak, um, when you meet someone like that. Um, but um, as you go through the, the, the uh, stages of enlightenment, uh, you're becoming increasingly universal. And so the resonance becomes more and more universal. So you may not resonate with someone and may not know whether they're awake or not and uh, where someone else may be quite obvious to you. Whereas uh, as they move through higher stages of enlightenment, it becomes more and more obvious. And just because it's the same, it's the same, they're, they're living from the same reality and it's kind of like there's a, uh, yeah, a resonance. <laughs> it, you, it's a feeling uh, essentially. Thank you. Sure. That relates to Darshan. Yeah, it's not it's not a, an introductory kind of. I mean, I'm introducing the the the, the my Vedic perspective, but it's um, um, yeah, I'm not I'm not a light <laughs> a light perspective of, of it. Uh, I like to try and go in there and, and talk about the the deeper nature because um, that's really what it's all about. If, if uh, I've got a question, yes. If when you when you're working towards uh, and 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 in a serious meditation uh, program. Do you work out all the shadow, all of the, you know, the unconscious parts that are the negative aspects of yourself that uh, you're not aware of? Is that part of the process of reaching enlightenment? Or yes. Nirvana? Yes. Um, no, it's an, it's, that's an interesting uh, question, actually, too. There's kind of the obvious level. Um, and... 
the essential teaching of yoga is what they call samadhi. And samadhi is essentially going beyond the, the, the emotions in the mind and into, into our deeper nature as consciousness. And that helps culture that value and, uh, and cultures the nervous system to be able to support that, that experience more. It also helps with the purification and clearing those negative things. However, I have found that most people uh, in the West uh, require some supplemental work, so to speak. Um, um, and so I, I do uh, also recommend um, some quality of energy healing, essentially where not some form, formal fancy stuff, but just essential, uh, essentially uh, emotional awareness and simple techniques to um, allow those uh, negative influences to to uh, resolve themselves and um, um, and support that process because the habit uh, so often is of resistance and we're not really recognizing that it becomes much more obvious after awakening where we've been we've been uh, resisting uh, our experience in some way and that can actually include seeing qualities uh, of ourselves as as negative uh, for example in my own uh, in my own case, uh, I viewed, I have a strong intellect and I, I viewed that as a negative spiritually. It was because of the strong mind kind of gets in the way, so to say, I, I thought it was something I had to get rid of. But in actual fact, it, it's, it was innate. And I realized that even in the midst of profound spiritual experiences, it was in there and uh, part of the process. And so what I, what I needed to, to shift was actually the, my relationship with it. Um, and uh, I, I guess you could say a quality of self-acceptance. Um, and it's interesting um, too, you know, for me, there was things that I assumed would fall away uh, with awakening and things that uh, I, would, I would maintain. But what those, and some in some cases that, that did happen with things, um, but in other cases, I was surprised to find that, that um, for example, my interest in, in playing musical instruments fell away, which I would have thought was a positive thing. But it, it turns out it was driven more by, you know, family influences. Uh, I still really enjoy music, but that, that um, the performance part uh, fell away. Uh, whereas there's other kinds of things that are, um, like I mentioned about the strong mind that I thought would fall away, but actually have gotten stronger. <laughs> and and it's kind of interesting too. A lot of people see uh, the, think that may per, that that with uh, enlightenment that emotions disappear, and some you become somehow a, a, a Vulcan or something. Uh, but the opposite, it actually it, it, they're freed up. It's a it's a liberation. It's a liberation of all aspects of the the person. And so uh, emotions become uh, fuller and, and uh, richer and uh, more profound. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting, um, there's a lot of expectations that, that uh, especially if you study this, this stuff for a while, um, you develop a lot of expectations about what it's supposed to be. And, uh, but the actuality for, and, and and the trick is one of the things that I found really interesting to realize was that from a cosmic level, consciousness is aware of itself globally and at every point. And essentially each of us are one of those points, the uh, soul you could, you could say, or jiva. And we're essentially each designed to have our own perspective of reality because that reality knows itself globally already but in order for it to know itself in all the details it takes these forms and uh and apparent apparent persons uh and each of us have different combinations of laws of nature and different uh a, a somewhat different perspective and it's through all of us together that we uh unfold the fullness of reality so each of us has a unique perspective and so our experience of the process and experience of life is going to be a little different. We're going to have our own take on it. And that's actually what we're bringing to the whole. It's our contribution. Um, 
yeah so it's it's not that we're all supposed to have the same experience it's <laughs> the opposite <laughs> but it, interestingly enough we do have that 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 uh, global and uh, universal value in common so we can still uh, have a shared reality and and uh, um, and communicate <laughs> about our experience i have a question since yes. you uh since you mentioned playing musical instruments, it's something I've been mulling over lately. And the, from in, in, in my experience, there seem to be very few people who talk about, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this from the standpoint of beauty, right? And the, the, the very few of the, like the only character that comes to mind that I'm familiar with is Rupert Spira talks a bit about beauty. And I think that's probably because of his background as an artist. Um, Muji also was a, a an artist in his background, but he seems I've never heard him talk about beauty. But there, there's there's something interesting to me about right, like we 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 do seek what is beautiful either through painting or sculpting or music or what have you, and I, I wonder if you could say something about that because there, there's a sense in which that seems to come from something deeper within us looking for expression but finding the expression returns it back to itself yes exactly that's kind of another way of saying what i just said um it's uh <laughs> yeah one of the things to to understand about the process um is that there's essentially two parallel processes taking place um one of them is the process of of consciousness waking up to itself and uh, unfolding in this progressively deeper levels. And there's a series of stages in, in that process of waking up of the, the witness or observer value, and then the waking up of the, of the behind the world value and the two coming together and so forth. That's a whole other uh, conversation. But um, those are stages of unfoldment of consciousness to itself. And it's, this is often described as the Shiva or the masculine uh, value of, of uh, consciousness. But there's also this other side, the feminine, um, and these aren't gender things I'm talking about here, it's, it's fundamental qualities of, of consciousness. The feminine, which is the expression, the world itself, um, uh, nature, um, uh, it's put in a, another uh, number of ways, uh, the Shakti, and um, uh, this is the, the means for consciousness to know itself. Uh, and this is much more about refinement of perception and the awakening heart and this is kind of it's a progressive where uh, consciousness uh, the stages in consciousness are sudden shifts and then progressive integration um, the stages uh, of the heart are progressive development to a climactic shift um, and um, and so they're kind of these two processes are kind of inter intertwined in the unfolding um, but in the West, there's a lot less, we're more repressed emotionally. Um, and uh, and that just is a lot less of that kind of expression. It's a lot more healing um, uh, on that level, that, like Gail brought up, um, to, uh, to allow that unfolding to take place. And so you see a lot more, you know, like in modern uh, Advaita circles, uh, there's a lot, it's a more dry expression. They talk only about consciousness in many cases, and uh, only about that those masculine qualities. And any talk about an awakening heart or refined perception is considered to be distraction and and uh, uh, or, or a problem in some way or something. Whereas actually, it's it's part of a balanced process. Now, again, everybody is is different, and they're going to be a different mixture. Um, some people are, have a rare number of people, but some people do have a lot of uh, refined perception kinds of things going on. Um, but without that inner grounding in consciousness, they tend to be tossed around by life's experiences, and it, it's a more challenging kind of experience of life. Um, and uh, whereas uh, someone who's who's only on the consciousness side of the, the equation uh, tends to have a much drier, flatter uh, kind of style. So the ideal is is to culture both, and uh, so that's why I mentioned about. Uh, uh, energy healing, for example, uh, because it's a way to help heal the, the uh, emotional, energetic kinds of dynamics. Uh, most people in the West have kind of a, actually a black crust 
around their uh, heart chakra uh, uh, as a defense, essentially, uh, because the uh, the world is uh, energetically harsh on with with the uh, fine feelings. But once you're once you're grounded in in that universal nature, uh, you know, like the texts talk about, water cannot burn it, nor fire, or fire not cannot burn it, no water wet it, or, uh, and so forth. It's um, it's uh, it creates a, a stable platform for a lot of development to happen. One of which is is the awakening uh, heart, and the shedding of the crust, and and uh, opening to universal values of love and compassion and and, uh, and so forth. Um, so there, there, and that that uh, uh, creates the the boundary for beauty to be uh, recognized and expressed in a much fuller way, and that because that's the key. If for beauty to be uh, recognized, we we have to be willing to feel. And and so if our heart is kind of cramped, it's it's a, it's a lot harder to to uh, feel uh, richly and and uh, without limit. Cool. Thank you. Um, I have a question about practices. <clears throat> so from when you were an observer to now, someone that's experiencing, how have your practices changed? Um, well, I, I continue to practice the same meditation, but the experience is quite different now. Um, before awakening, there was transcending, they call it, uh, essentially uh, the settling of the of the activity of the emotions in the mind and, and, and stepping down into a deeper nature. It was kind of foggy at first, but gradually got clearer. Um, but it's basically going beyond the mind and we're transcending, hence the, the name transcendental meditation. And um, I, I believe this is the essential style that, that uh, is talked about in the, in the Vedic tradition. Um, it comes out of the Shankara, uh, Shankara's tradition. And um, the, the, the key is with yoga and with, with, um, with meditation is effortless. So you're not... Uh, uh, you're not trying to control the process. You're you're shifting from your individuality into into your your broader nature, and those more subtle. You know, I mentioned before about the bliss body. Those more subtle levels are are more charming and and so on. And so when when we um, begin a practice that doesn't uh, is not uh, constrain doesn't constrain us to the mind by trying to control, the mind will naturally settle into in, in, within because those subtle levels are, are more charming uh, more universal and um, and then the result is samadhi the touching into our deeper nature as as consciousness and again it's can be pretty uh, vague at first but over time uh, as we clear the clear the way the clear the dust so to speak uh, it becomes uh, clearer and clearer um, and uh, and then that kind of prepares the ground and, and sets the stage for the, the shift. But so after we wake up, there, there isn't transcending because we're already there. Um, so it's more what uh, some would call presence. It, it's, it's kind of basically shifting from having the, the mind and senses focused outwards on, on things around me, around and you know what I'm doing or whatever. It's closing the eyes and the attention falls within. And so it just, it's like dropping the world instead of, instead of, uh, transcending the coming just settling into the essential nature but but you know it's uh it gets more and more broad kind of the deeper the state you go on the stages the more uh universal it is i mean self-realization that initial awakening feels very universal it feels like it's infinite and eternal and in its nature it is um but there is a great deal more that can it can go bigger and, and more universal <laughs> and uh, deeper in its process. More questions? Anybody? 
Uh, yeah, I actually had one. So whenever I hear people talk about the uh, the Vedic studies, they always talk about it as like this insurmountable lifelong journey, you know, 10,000 pieces of literature. But uh, I was just wondering, like, where, where do you recommend like first first step on the journey? Well, I guess I would, for a first step, I would recommend the means that, that you have some value of, of, of uh, samadhi going on so that it's you're developing the direct experience. And then you support that with study. Um, and um, a, lot of, a lot of what's taught of Eastern philosophy is on that level of concepts. Um, and many of the Western, Western teachings are um, uh, essentially conceptual uh, interpretations of another culture and times concepts and so there's kind of like there's another layer of of uh, uh to it that's um i wouldn't say misleading exactly but it's it's it's, it's just still in the, on the level of the mind and so yeah a, a, a practical application where where you're culturing that and then uh study it so there are places where where uh, uh that are more aligned with with you know what i would consider the 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 actual traditional understanding um which not as common even in india but um they are around uh, and you know and there are uh quite uh, amazing teachers out there um and and then there's you know it kind of depends i mean there, there's certainly uh the the teachings aren't you know confined to the vedic tradition um the uh um, there are, you know, teachers from all cultures who, who are essentially teaching the same thing. What appeals to me personally, why, why the Vedas appeals to me is because that, you know, the light, I mentioned the lights coming on early on and I started experiencing um, these the subtle structures of, of uh, the world. That's not uh, typical necessarily. Uh, everybody has their own process and some people are, are more visual um like a friend of mine uh is very uh, aware of the uh emotional mental and uh, intellect structures and uh, where people are constrained in some way um they're a professional energy healer um that led to that whereas my emphasis has been uh subtler and they're more on the level of a feeling value whereas I'm more visual and, um, and other people are more uh, audio so that they'll relate to it and, and bring out different values and different understanding uh, from uh, different perspectives. Um, and so, from, but for me, because uh, there was a lot of visual experience, uh, not very many traditions go into the, those details. So that's where the Vedic tradition uh, really appealed to me. They talk like, you know, the first big one here was, was what's known as Haranyagarbha or the golden egg. Essentially it's experiencing the universe from the outside and, and how it comes to be. And um, I don't know any other tradition except the Vedic tradition that talks about that. And it talks about it quite widely, quite a bit. So uh, that's where for me, uh, with the, my style unfolding, the Vedic tradition uh, appealed a great deal. Um, and it was only later in life that I managed to study it uh, academically more uh, formally um, uh, but I did but I have except for when I had a young family and stuff uh, I, it, it was a part of my life in various ways uh, through there trying and I can say you know the sources now uh, are so much better I, I can recall going into the the uh, stacks they called it of the library at the the nearby university to step you know look up stuff find some books on this stuff and that and a lot of the translations were other people who didn't have good grounding in English. And so they were hard to, <laughs> hard to read from that standpoint, or they were English interpretations, like, like uh, many of the early Ved Vedic texts were translated by a German fellow named Max Mueller, who viewed it as, as essentially a bunch of mythological fairy stories and, and brought that interpretation to it. And then the early English translations were, were based on his translation. And so, you know, the, the foundational understanding wasn't there. And uh, so a lot of the early texts are not uh, 
very cleanly translated. So yeah, so the, 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 the first thing you wanna do is, is develop the means and then, uh, and then as knowledge by itself, you know, has limited value. Um, whereas if you have, have the, of this kind of thing, um, whereas if you have uh, that uh, qualities of experience going on, then you can use the knowledge to, to support that. I've got another question. Um, I've been more in the Buddhist uh, practice and I've taken yes. the Kali Chakra initiation, which is the Buddhist path. But my the Rinpoche that did that I received the initiation from uh, is in Australia. And uh, I in the United States, there's not a lot of Rinpoche's that are working on enlightenment. <laughs> Or, or the Kali Chakra uh, path. Um, and now he has an online program, but I'm, I, I realize, I mean, I know it's an individual uh, path. Everybody has to find their path and I'm not wedded to, I mean, and I, they're all, like you say, it's, it's, they're all pointing the same direction. Uh, yes. So anyway, I guess my question is, if you, from the United States, what, what where is a good program? That, so that you've got some structure, although, you know, the work you've got to do and to understand that part. Yeah, well, it's, it's actually an interesting thing because I, I um, for some, some people have a single path through their life. They find the teacher and they take them through the whole process. Um, other people uh, will have a sequence of, of teachers. Uh, that's happened here, for example. Uh, they're all uh, in a related tradition, um, but um, they've had different roles at different times in my life when, when, when they were needed. Um, and sometimes we're kind of, we're in a place where there's kind of a, you know, we've been used to the, a certain approach for a while and we're kind of getting pushed to change, uh, but, you know, we're not, we're resisting that in some way. And sometimes, you know, we're kind of, um, there's people I, I, I recall back in the early days where I, I knew people who would go to all the different teachers when it, whenever somebody came through town, they'd go in and listen to it. And, and they're kind of like um, trying to cherry pick, but not really committing to anything. Not really, uh, uh, because, you know, I, I get that with my blog. Sometimes people send me questions and sometimes I'm getting uh, people who are, they're trying to compare two completely different paths and try to figure out which is right. Whereas um, they're not necessarily compatible in that kind of way. And in, in some ways you, you need to, and it's not universally true, but for a lot of people, <clears throat> this tends to be about making a commitment to, to something that resonates with them and that works for them. Um, but it's, uh, um, you know, the, the TM organization, uh, they do have uh, a whole, uh, they, they, they have TM centers and they have various courses and, and uh, they have online classes. I mean, it's based in the Vedic uh, tradition, um, but it's kind of been secularized for, for the West. And, um, they have various uh, classes that are online and, and they have a university in, in Iowa. Uh, that's where I got my uh, master's. Um, uh, I, I went there basically because they, they have, you know, like the guy that wrote the textbooks on Sanskrit uh, uh, was one of, is there a Sanskrit professor, you know, the, the, the ones they use at most the major universities. Um, and, uh, and they had this, this understanding. It wasn't just on the level of of uh, theoretical, but you know, like as you undoubtedly have experienced, any spiritual organization is going to have uh, dynamics and egos in play, and and uh, um, and so you know the, the key is is uh, finding what's of value to you, and um, and not getting taught, caught in the dramas and the and the. Uh, uh, the politics, I guess you could say. Um, 
yeah so it's i mean there's certainly uh value there but but for myself i mean i'm, I'm taking a course in the brahma sutra through uh through the university right now they're teaching online um and uh that's and it's really nice to have that um that perspective being brought to it uh because the brahma sutras if you've ever looked at them are essentially uh they're looked at as uh intellectual arguments for brahman uh for the the absolute um but are uh, actually a list of recognitions of in unity consciousness in the third stage of enlightenment um where essentially there with unity there is an initial shift where you recognize that not only am i the the cosmic self within but the the cosmic self is also kind of like the movie screen on which the world world is playing out mm -hmm. and uh, those are the same self and it's a, an internal recognition and they come together into one wholeness um, hence unity and um, but it's a progressive because then you go out and you experience your life and you see oh that is also myself and oh that is also myself and all the layers of experience are gradually integrated into one wholeness which the Brahma Sutra calls the aggregate and so essentially the text is listing not a series of intellectual understandings, but um, a series of recognitions in experience. And they understand this in this course. And so that's really valuable because most, uh, essentially any translations I've seen, see them as, as, I mean, Shankara did a commentary on the Brahma Sutra and that is intellectual arguments uh, about the, the validity of it. Uh, but the, the text itself is not an intellectual argument. It's a, a recognitions of the intellect of the nature of, of reality. So it's an experiential thing again, uh, somewhat like I was talking about with the uh, Rick Bade. Um, so yeah, so it's, there's a lot of possibilities out there. There are some very good teachers, um, but there's a lot of uh, noise yeah. level so to speak. Uh, I've spoken at the Science and Non-Duality Conference um, in California several times. And um, the uh, I, what I found is that the popular teachers um, and the, the main line speakers, some of them are, are, are self-realized, but the, there are a number of them there, for example, deny anything further. There's a single awakening and any talk of stages is either a concept that's a barrier or is a delusion. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's an interesting, uh, I mean, I didn't even bother going there at first because it was that was quite entrenched early on. Uh, but gradually, more and more people have unfolded these further stages. And so um, it's become more and more accepted as, as, as a potential. And so um, the essentially the, the community became open to uh, talk of, of stages um the further stages so it's a it's an interesting dynamic but but you know the key of course is is resonance you know i uh, it, it's an interesting thing you know uh, for example i i found that i really valued uh jashanti's uh books he has a couple of books where he talks about the transition after awakening you know talking about the unpacking and so on that i was talking about earlier and some of the the, the things that can happen for people um and uh but i don't resonate with him as a teacher but i really value his books mm -hmm. uh on the flip side you know i've seen gangaji a couple of times and as, as a teacher and i have a strong resonance with her but i don't resonate at all with her teaching her her approach uh probably because i have a strong intellect and and uh want to go into a lot more detail where she avoids that uh she doesn't want to create concepts um but it's kind of like this this debate. I mean, do you if a person is on a tra is traveling on the road? Do you give them a map, or do you deny them the map because they may they may confuse the map with the journey? Um, and it's kind of this debate because yeah, because I know just from feedback I get from people when I that um, people do get confused sometimes by my writing, um, and uh, I'm primarily primarily a writer and um, and uh, have a large blog. And um, so I get people writing to me saying that they've they've had their unity consciousness shift, and they're they're in the uh, 
third stage of enlightenment, but um, they haven't actually woken up yet. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that they're kind of, you know, the ego has kind of gotten involved and, and tried to make, you know, make, make the self special and, and, and so on. So there is that, that hazard with talking about it. But on the other hand, there is a lot of people who are uh, awakening these days. And, um, and so it's really valuable for them to understand the potential and, and to bring context to some of what's unfolding. Because it's, it's all natural, but if you have no background or understanding um, of what's happening, uh, when your reality is shifting, there can be a, 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 an inclination to resist it in some way or to think it's wrong or, uh, uh, or not know how to support it properly so that it, it uh, settles in uh, and is integrated properly. So the, that's where it's really valuable is for, for people for whom it's unfolding. But it's also valuable for people who are studying this stuff because it, it gives context to so much of this. Um, where, you know, like for someone to say uh, they're, they're a neo Advaita or they're an Advaita teacher of non duality, but to deny non duality, because <laughs> self realization itself is actually known in, in, in uh, Advaita as duality, Dvaita, uh, because uh, there's a duality of experience. There's the inner self is awake to itself, but we're still experiencing a separate world. Now, a lot of them in the neo Advaita community will, will say, oh, the world is an illusion. And so we don't have to pay attention to that. There just is one internal uh, oneness within. But it, but it actually, uh, it's still there. It's still in the experience. And so it may be experienced as illusion, but that's actually a stage of a quality of uh, a stage of development. It's not the nature of reality itself. Um, when, just to explain that briefly, when, when um, the, there, there's, there's this concept of three gunas or subtle qualities in the Vedic tradition that underlie everything. And when Thomas guna is inertia essentially uh, is dominant in the experience, we experience the world around us as solid and real. And that's most people. Yeah. Uh, when we do spiritual practices, uh, it tends to culture uh, rajas or fire of uh, transformation. So we go through transformative things. We There's healing, there's openings and so on like that taking place. And when rajas is dominant, we can experience the world as illusory. So it seems to be just a, a, an appearance. Uh, what's real is, is the inner experience rather than the outer experience. It's kind of flips. And then uh, as we go further along in the spiritual progress, then uh, sattva becomes dominant. Um, purity or clarity, excuse me. And, um, and then we experience the world as the divine play, kind of the, the, the unfolding of, of uh, the, our inner nature. And so it's not seen as illusory in the same way. Um, so each of those are perspectives based on, on the, the quality of our experience. And, you know, looping back to what I was talking about earlier, um, there's a lot of people who are having that uh, initial awakening, uh, but if there isn't enough sattva being developed, then there isn't the refinement of perception and the awakening heart taking place. Because the, the, uh, some practices do culture, um, like mindfulness, will culture um, the uh, awareness of consciousness uh, and of our observing nature, um, but they don't have a healing quality because we're not uh, transcending and going uh, and settling the physiology. Uh, there isn't the healing taking place. And because also we're, we're dropping through the layers uh, towards consciousness uh, in the practice, um, we very, very gradually become more and more conscious of those layers. And, and that culture is refinement of perception. Uh, so that's the value of, of uh, another value of, uh, of a practice of, of samadhi, transcending. Anyway, so I'm kind of wandering around there. <laughs> What's the name of the university that you're talking about? Oh, it's about called uh, yeah, it's called Maharishi International University. Uh, MIU.edu. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Since we're about at the end of the session, um, oh. do any of you have any uh, 
logistical questions or questions about class or obviously questions for David. You, you guys are kind of tame today. <laughs> <laughs> on, Mon on Monday, I couldn't shut you up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of a big download here. Um, I, I did, did want to mention my website is uh, davidja.ca. So it's davidya.ca. Uh, there's lots of articles and so on uh, exploring these these topics in in more detail. And I'll give you that information also. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Screams, grunts, groans, cries of anguish, peals of joy. Any of that? The usual. Oh, he answered it uh, as I was about to ask it. I was going to ask for the website. Oh, good. Thank you for the questions. It's good questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for the talk, Dave, for talking to us. Oh, you're welcome. I was going to say thank you so much for taking the time and talking to us. It's been very interesting. Oh, thank yeah. you. I, I think I you're could welcome. have just I could have just uh, gone on listening to you talk the whole time about the Vedic traditions. Um, yeah, yeah, it's very rich, as, as yeah, others but, have mentioned. That's one, of, that's one of the things I was wondering about, like with, with some of the stuff you were talking about later, is that given given that in in the in this part of the world this is a fairly recent phenomenon of people sort of waking up it seems that the richness of the traditions of india could be very helpful there and yeah. maybe maybe should be but they also there needs to be a bit of a revival as, as i mentioned because there is that uh, tendency to to you know view it as as something hard you know and um and you know, taking a long, long time, and you know, lifetimes of of, of practice, of hard practices to get anywhere, and so on. Um, yeah. yeah, I just meant in terms of you know what we might call the science of yoga, or the science of Vedic. Yes, you know. but there is a revival taking place because it is how you know it, it, people are getting results and and yeah. talking about what worked for them, like you know we're doing today, and uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you again so much.